Hello, everybody, and welcome to B-Sides. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you to the organizers. I can't find Charles in here. He's probably stress sweating upstairs. But thank you to the organizers for bringing us all together and for making it so much bigger. Um, it's, it's, it's quite amazing. Thank you to all of the volunteers for all of your efforts and to my fellow speakers for making a, what's hopefully going to be an amazing day, what will be an amazing day. So I want to talk to you today about something very simple. Toko asked me outside what you talk about, and I said it's about arresting criminals. And he's like, cool, I don't need to attend now. So if, if you want to know what the takeaway is, that's it, and you can leave now. Um, so I want to do two things in the talk today. The first is to convince you that what we're doing from a defensive point of view right now has diminishing returns, and we're leaning a little too hard into increasingly diminishing returns. Um, and so that's, there's some subtlety there. I'm not saying let's stop defending, that would be dumb, um, or we must stop everything we're doing today. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying at some point, you're going too far down that road, and the returns aren't worth it for how much effort you're putting into it, and we should do something else. And the thing I'm proposing that is something else is, is in, create law enforcement outcomes on criminals. Now, there's some complexity there, because you go, oh, we live in South Africa, and police, and uh. So I want to try and convince you that that's actually something we can do. And the problem with this talk is this isn't a well-trodden thing. I don't have a product to sell you. I can't point to 12 organizations that are doing this successfully. This is an idea that I think is really important that I want to try and convince you of and enlist you into, there's no club, enlist your thinking into this. You don't have to tell me that you were sold on it. What I would love is that the ideal outcome is we start uh, reducing the pool of criminals in the country. And, and so the problem with this is this is like the most nervous I've been for a talk in a long time. For, I think for two reasons. One, because this is, this is our community and it, and it matters. And the second is because that, uh, that point really matters to me. I'm really passionate about it. And I think it's super important for where we are in cybersecurity and where we are in South Africa. Okay, my name's Dominic White. And I put a picture of myself up there so I'd remember what I look like. Um, if you want to say something nice, if you could do it publicly, and if you want to say something mean, just email me. I don't know. <laughs> okay, so 10 years ago, a colleague of mine named Panda, some of you might know him from Capitech, where he stopped being called Panda. Uh, his name was Jeremy, who knew? Um, he and I gave a, a talk at IT Web, like just over 10 years ago, called Offense Oriented Defense. And it was born of being a pen tester at that point for about four or five years, where I was like, sort of shocked that we kept being successful against organizations that had very large security budgets and spent a lot of time doing security. And I didn't understand why. I'm like, I mean, we're not that good at this. Why do we keep successfully breaking into organizations? So my thought at the time was, I think people aren't responsive to the actual attacks that they face. They're doing defense stuff that isn't the same as what the offense stuff is. So there was this kind of mismanagement. I'll talk about it later with the falling pianos problem, if you want to remember that point. And 10 years later, I think what's changed, if I could go back to myself from 10 years ago, or at least what's changed in my thinking, is that I no longer think that we can lean harder into what we're doing defensively right now, that we can just magically do it better and everything will be okay, but that we actually need something new. And that something new is to address the root cause of this, which is criminals and, and criminality. So the weird thing about cybersecurity is that if you look at the history of competitive endeavors in the world, of which cybersecurity is one, right? It's defenders versus attackers. Nobody will ever win by playing just defense. If the Springboks only played defense, they wouldn't have won the Rugby World Cup. They probably wouldn't have even been in the top 10. You can't defend your way, because at some point, somebody's gonna score a goal, you'll make a mistake, and then how do you retake, retake the advantage if you have no offense? We've got this idea that if we can just wrap our users, our networks and systems in enough padding, we can send them out into a world where people have guns and are shooting at them and that somehow they're gonna be okay. But if you know, a bullet gets through, we just add more layers of padding on this. It's weird. Why do we think that defense is the only thing we can do against attackers who are attacking us? And then as cyber defenders, we're like, you know what? The people who know what's going on will give them radios and they can use those against people who have guns. The, the, the greatest consequence we in this room can leverage against real adversaries attacking our systems is to merely evict them from our networks. That is not really a consequence because then they can just come back and attack again. Maybe we can take down some of their toys, some of their servers, they put them up again. 
Attackers retain the asymmetry because they have the ability to keep reusing their attacks, and defenders have no ability to scale their defensive efforts. You have to rebuild the defensive effort at every company and with every individual that we bring into society. So we've got this problem where we can never win in a war because we have no ability to engage in offense. There's a common saying, peacekeepers have guns, because we acknowledge at some point to create a peaceful environment, you have to be able to engage in an offensive war against the people who are disrupting that peace. So we need offense. The easy answer is, oh, well, that's hack back, that's vigilantism. I'm not talking about that. I want to use law enforcement, and I'll get to that, I'll get to that later. Okay, but we do have to defend, right? It's all really easy to say, great, we'll go arrest some criminals and we'll be done. But unfortunately, this entire industry exists around actually defending things. And so I want to give some examples of defensive models that we've used, that are currently in use, that kind of follow what I've observed um, in the industry in the last couple of years. And what I want to do with these next things is convince you that we're leaning too hard into some of the defense. So that's not the same as throw the baby out with the bathwater. What I'm saying is at some point, diminishing returns kick in. You need to stop and do something else. You've done enough of this thing. Maybe keep doing it, maintain it, but don't take it further. Let's do something else. Okay, so in my time in cybersecurity, which is starting to be long, uh, I've seen a couple of things happen. When I first started, uh, firewalls were not ubiquitous. The idea of putting machines on the internet was how we did it. And then a bunch of worms came along and took out uh, large parts of the internet. And then we put firewalls in place. Uh, and then at some point, like bug track was the forefront of the information security industry. We kind of lauded bugs, vulnerability focus, and vulnerability centrism was a big part of it. And then I remember having this argument with Rob as a, I was still with Deloitte and you were with Investec and internal audit about how we could like prioritize and defend our machines. I think there was dueling blog posts even back in the day when blog posts were a thing. That, you know, can we meaningfully protect the crown jewels with some kind of security nihilism in place, knowing we can't protect anything? Uh, and then more recently, I think we've moved on to what I was talking about in 2013, is understanding what the attackers are doing, looking at their attacks and defending against that. But all of these models have some kind of diminishing returns. I want to go through a couple of them. Okay, so the perimeter approach is, oh, too many slides is born of this castle thinking. If any of you have sat down with a security architect, or maybe you are a security architect yourself, or you've thought about security models, it's often related, truthfully, to the ideas from the 9th and 13th century of castles, concentric layers of defense, defense in depth. Uh, I'm not saying these are bad things, but this is how we think about security. So when we draw networks, you know, here's the DMZ and here's the, the inside of the network. Uh, when we draw applications, we go, you know, here's the outer authentication layer, pre-authentication and internal. We have all of these conceptual models we use to understand what our systems are doing. But the problem with this is that we don't have conceptual models for pe the way people actually use this. I mean, what is, where does a VPN fit in here? Do they teleport to the center? Is that, is that how this works? How do, you, how, do I, how do I draw this? So the, the truth of this is that the concentric model of defense is a c convenient lie that I think we tell ourselves a lot of the time. And back in 2008 with the Jericho Forum, uh, they, they made this point. They said the perimeter is dead, we need to stop doing this. And the Jericho Forum uh, was based on this idea, I'm sure all of you read your Bible this morning, that they walked around the walls of Jericho and then God made the walls fall down. But what organizations like BP were saying and investing a lot of money into is that the perimeters are dead, we need to uh, defend differently. And zero trust takes its, its birth from these, these kind of ideas. So this, this perimeter model is not just from a network security point of view that it's firewalls on the internet. It's talking more widely about these concentric ideas that we have. And the problem with that is that those concentric models don't map to reality. So if we think about physical locations, as this slide implies, we've got people working at home in coffee shops, and we've got branches, and we've got head offices. There's a lot of physical locations. How does that fit into a concentric model? So we go, OK, cool, everywhere that's not the organization is outside, and this is inside. Um, and hackers will know that's very convenient for them, because the second you're past that crunchy outer shell, you kind of have unfettered movement. But then if you look at a network level, how does a Wi-Fi, a VPN, how does a third-party VPN, site-to-site -site VPN fit into our concentric models? And then more importantly, when we real users operate across those concentric models. So if you think about a third party using their site-to-site -site VPN to log into a software as a service uh, tool that your organization is running, which concentric 
model are we on? Are we on physical? Are we on network? Are we on authentication? And the concentric models we always forget to write down are the authentication ones. Hackers know that you can steal creds from a third-party marketing site because that credential has been conveniently synchronized manually with the actual uh, credentials people use to log into the organization. And there's a link there. It's not a link any organization is aware of, and you only discover it when you try and do it. But these, these models are too complex. So these perimeters that we keep creating are kind of falsehoods that don't, don't work for us. So our response as an industry has just been to make the endpoint the new perimeter. Let's just keep stuffing enough things into the laptop and our users until eventually they will be perfectly secure everywhere they go. Some of you might be experiencing the slowness that comes with Intune and multi-factor authentication posture checkings on your laptop right now. We've kind of given up on this idea that uh, there, there is a, a meaningful perimeter, so let's just stick it all, stick it all on the laptop. Uh, but the, the problem with this idea is, is first off, uh, Hardware key loggers still work. Like this ancient attack that you can plug something in between a keyboard and the computer and record those keystrokes. We still have the meaningful defense against a commonly used real attack from actual attackers that happens all the time. Uh, so have we meaningfully defended our endpoint? Um, and then the other thing is we seem to be sort of under the idea that we can sort of fish users into never trusting what they read on the screen and somehow con men will stop existing. And in the history of the world, con men have always been successful because at some point humanity needs to be able to trust another human being and we're not going to fish our users into breaking the social contract such that nobody can ever con someone again. Um, so we've got, it isn't really a meaningful perimeter and just throwing more technology at it isn't going to fix some of those core problems. Now again, I'm not saying don't patch your machine, don't have multi-factor authentication. Those are all useful things. But at some point, you're not going to multi-factor posture check, patch your machine into somebody um, no longer trusting other human beings. OK, so then we have this, this vulnerability point of view. And what I don't want to do here is try and convince you that patching eventually fails or that you can't bug hunt your way to, to security. Because I think you know that, and there's lots of places uh, that, where people have said the same thing. Instead, I want to kind of look at the theories underpinning that. What's the thinking that we bring into this, and how does it create the asymmetry people talk about in the organization? So back in 2013, you introduced this idea of your defenses are a wall. Okay, every new layer of security that you build in is a new layer of the wall that you build. You have to build this wall, it's expensive, you have to maintain this wall. But we knew it was a dumb idea when Donald Trump said it, because an attacker can go build a 50 <laughs> Go buy a $50 ladder. And what I was talking about earlier is the scalability of the attacks versus the staticness of defenses. You have to keep building the wall at every organization. The attackers get to reuse their ladder against every organization. There is an ability always to scale the attacks, and the asymmetry is built in there. So when you say, how do you make it cost an attacker more than it costs a defender to defend, what is the cost of employing a CISO all of the political stuff they have to go to to justify the budget, all of the very expensive tools that they need to install, not to mention the scarce skill resources that you have to find, train, and retain, if anyone wants to know where the real expense comes from of people in this industry. Um, with all of that, attackers get to do the fun, smart, technical work of making something that works and then reusing it, which is why ransomware is such a problem, because attackers have an ability to just scale their attacks across an organization, and it's a game of numbers. If it doesn't work there, then we, we apply it there. In the meantime, we keep building this wall. What's worse is that the surface area just stays constant, and this is, there's some nuance at this point. So when I first started getting interested in security, one of the founders of our company, Rulof Temming, wrote this, uh, this white paper called Breaking into Computers Over the Internet. It was an amazing read, but it highlighted that at the time, it was possible to meaningfully compromise organizations is that yeah. meaningfully compromised organizations based on vulnerabilities in their infrastructure over the internet? Now, that's no longer the case, unless you're Citrix, F5, uh, Fortinet, yeah, Cisco, anyway. Um, it's no longer trivially the case, should we say, that you can compromise machines over the internet at an infrastructure level. So what happened is the attacks moved to an application layer. So then we were compromising organizations over the internet using things like SQL injection. And then after that stuff got locked down as the frameworks improved, we moved to phishing attacks. And so while the overall surface area seems to be reducing, because we are making meaningful improvements in those layers, the usable popular surface area remains the same. As a new attacker coming into this industry, you can learn what the popular attacks are and use the popular maintained toolkits right now and be almost as successful as you could 20 years ago when pen testers were getting into it, even though those attacks have shifted. So 
cool, the surface area is reducing, even though the usable surface area remains the same. Does that mean we're eventually going to be secure? I haven't seen it yet. I'd love to believe that we can be. And then we keep introducing new technology into it. If we start talking about the cloud, there's whole new levels of surface area which will continue to provide vulnerabilities for us. So your wall has a lot of holes in that are very difficult to stop caring about because attacks keep finding new areas that have holes in, not that the overall holes are getting less, if that makes sense. I may be stretching this wall analogy. <laughs> the other problem is you have to maintain the wall. Any homeowners here, particularly down in the Cape, probably know that that's difficult. Um, and the, the, the maintenance analogy here is that defenses atrophy over time. So what that means is, in the beginning, there'll be a defense which is really effective, but as attackers get more and more comfortable with bypassing that defense, then the defenses drop off. You still need to maintain them. They don't get cheaper. Your license fee doesn't get reduced because now attackers have a solid understanding of how your defense works. And so this is my unscientific attempt at science, you know, just drew graphs over time. So. The problem here is, as a, as a defender, you invest in some security technology, it's effective, you continue to invest in it, you have to keep building the wall, you have to maintain the wall. As attackers, your attacks only get more effective against aging technology, not aging technology, aging technology ideas. Um, and this leads to the, the asymmetry that everyone talks about. Defenders have to keep defending harder, attackers get to scale their attacks in, in different ways. Okay, so. Then, then we hit security nihilism. We went, you know what, you can't defend everything, let's at least defend the crown jewels. And maybe you're in here going, look, I know that's not gonna work, but I tell you, the whole internal and external audit fraternity is built on this very idea. Their audit plan every year is, what are your critical systems, and let's go and audit those. The problem with this, of course, is that crown jewels don't exist in isolation. They're connected to networks and they have systems they're connected to. And the complexity of those graphs we're talking about is really high. So if anyone's looked at a Bloodhound report and mapped that to their understanding of what Active Directory looks like in that organization, they'll see there's almost no overlap. Those graphs are infinitely complex and don't seem to relate to our conceptual understanding of those things. So systems exist within, uh, within, within networks. I've seen examples of somebody's installed a server under their desk to monitor some critical system somewhere and then you compromise the server under the desk which happens to have credentials to get into that system. So now do we have to include our SAP server, our mainframe, and the server under the desk? Or more differently, how do we meaningfully enumerate all those things? So we tend to forget about the server under the desk. By the way, my daughter insisted I put that animation in. <laughs> I was very impressed. We've seen it in the SWIFT environment. So if you look at what happened with SWIFT, where you had these Bangladeshi bank heists, the North Korean Lazarus group stole millions by abusing this interbanking system. So the response from SWIFT was to add these additional controls that you have to attest to every year uh, around, the SWIFT, around the SWIFT systems. Now, SWIFT is an interbanking network. So it provides you the core SWIFT Alliance kit in a financial organization provides you access to that network. So the problem is you secure the crown jewels Meanwhile, there's 40 to 100 different systems which can initiate SWIFT transactions that get sent there. So there's an ecosystem every time you look at something uh, with security that just gets really complex. So the crown jewels end up not working. We also seem to lean into this idea that we can keep enumerating and detecting enough badness to find our way out of this problem. Years ago, it was with antivirus where they would write signatures for everything they saw. But modern, I mean, we have a managed uh, security detection response service. You know, we're just as much part of this problem. Seams and XDR are all more attempts at enumerating badness. But people who pen test networks will tell you that maybe you do a lot of that stuff in the beginning, but trendy concepts like living off the land are because at some point you're getting detected and you need to look like a legitimate user. And by the time you get to the core systems, you do look like a legitimate user. When you're initiating transactions on SAP to exfiltrate money out of the business as a supplier, you're doing that as the head of finance using their legitimate access in a legitimate way, even if at some point it started with a Kerberos. So by that point, if we're just focusing on our crown jewels, you miss the very important context which would tell you that this is an attacker, but we tend not to look at those campaigns. Okay, but the response that we got to with this is that if we just find enough stormy teacups and jaunty crickets and bears wearing jackets, this is a threat to Intel joke, it's not landing quite as well as I hoped, uh, then we'll know about the attacks against our organization and we can defend against those. Great, this is kind of what I was talking about in 2013. 
Uh, and I call it the falling pianos problem. And I keep thinking people have seen the slide from me so many times it's boring, but uh, I think it's a useful one. So the falling pianos problem is what, I, what I, I use to describe the problems we have in information security and cybersecurity where we keep worrying about the wrong attacks. We're worried about an APT, meanwhile there's a, a, a low-level ransomware group that's going after us. And the idea is if you have to meet someone in a dark alley in a bad neighborhood in the middle of the night and your first concern is that a piano could fall on your head, you're doing it wrong. You've misunderstood the attacks that you're about to face and you're defending against the wrong attack. If you understand that a mugging is the more likely outcome, you can do something about that. You can wear a stab-proof vest, you can bring Ulrich along, he's a badass. Uh, you can meet in a different neighborhood at a different time of day. Then you are defending against the actual attacks you might face and you're not misallocating the funds. Right? And the way we do that in cybersecurity is through threat intelligence. And the idea is that if people publish enough information about... I'm trying to think of Microsoft's names, Puce. Puce Teacup, I don't know any anyway, of these names. Uh, and if you can buy enough commercial threat intelligence, then these will overlap with the kind of attacks you're about to face. Uh, then you will be well prepared for those attacks and you will be able to counter them. Now, we're not naive. We know that there isn't perfect alignment between these things, but we expect that there's some kind of meaningful overlap, and particularly that that overlap is on the most critical, most prolific, most dangerous threat actors. But when you look into this stuff, when we have used threat intel for our own purposes to try and understand how do we defend organizations in South Africa, it looks a lot like this. A lot of the time there is zero overlap between the commercial and public threat intel that we're seeing. Chinese actors going after US national assets unfortunately don't do a lot in South Africa. And even when they do, we don't necessarily have the visibility and instrumentation to find out in the first place. So we've got this problem where the threat intel doesn't necessarily align with the actual attacks we're facing. Then we've got another problem. When we do have perfect knowledge, we still get it wrong. So this is a screenshot from the MITRE attack evaluations. So if you don't know, MITRE attack evaluations happen once a year. They do a call for threat intelligence and they say, hey, uh, what, what kind of attacks can we use to emulate for our XDR and EDR vendors to try and detect? If you want to know more about this, my colleague Leon Jacobs is doing a fantastic talk about work he did on this later today. So with these MITRE attack evaluations, this year they called for Turla. Was Turla 2016? This, no, no, what, what, when did the bad person actually do their bad things? <laughs> 2018. After, okay. So they're a Russian threat actor, threat actor that hacked a bunch of stuff. And they had this really interesting set of attacks that they did, which Leon will tell you more about. And uh, MITRE then goes and implements all of these attacks. So the EDR vendors know exactly what attacks are going to be implemented and what they need to detect. So this is, should be the case where they get a perfect score. Right? This is a known attack, they're doing things they were told about, they should be able to detect it. So this is screenshots I took after, um, from the MITRE Attack Evolves website after I didn't believe a marketing post I saw from Palo Alto. Uh, it turns out it was true. So Palo Alto, of course, got everything there, so it's great marketing for Palo Alto. But that is the baseline. If we're paying all this money to tools to detect known things that we've seen before and they can't detect known things we've seen before, then uh, what? What? So the, the problem we face is that even when we have perfect knowledge about the attacks, we end up with a performance issue. And that's before we end up with coverage and skills and all of the uh, complexity required to actually run these in an organization. And I want to make a car analogy because famously the best way to be wrong in cybersecurity is to talk about cars. So in a, with a car, we create safety by having a bunch of systems, right? So we've got airbags and seat belts, and I'm not a car person. Roll cages, crumple zones, assistive braking. I think those are all things that are in cars. Uh, so we do those to create safety. But safety is not a result of those things being present. Safety is a result of those things functioning together in a dynamic situation to create safety. So safety is an emergent property of the controls functioning in a live situation. And that's a lot like security. We're not gonna audit our way to compliance and security by checking that all of these things exist. We need to understand that in a dynamic situation that they can function together. And sometimes in a car they don't function. You know, if you get hit the wrong way, maybe people are gonna die. And sometimes in security that might be the case too. And with a car, you're going up against inanimate objects. Sometimes the inanimate objects are steered by a person. But in cybersecurity, we're going up against creative, deliberate, adaptive adversaries. So Brian Snow, the ex-head of information assurance, the NSA, in response to a question about whether they could use a risk-based prioritization approach defending the nuclear stockpile in America, said, no, 
because adversaries will not follow your risk checklist, and we need to understand what a creative, uh, deliberate adversary looks like. And so, when we're talking about attacks that we know that we can't defend against, what does it look like with creative, deliberate adversaries who aren't using the attacks that you've seen before? Because a lot of the reason why pen testers continue to be employed is the requirement is for them to invent new ways of doing this the whole time. If we could just reuse the toolkit, well, that's what attack simulations are for. Okay. We're now halfway into this, and I'm going to talk about what I actually wanted to talk to you about. <laughs> so remember, I wanted to do two things. The first was to convince you that at some point we're leaning too hard into our defenses and we get diminishing returns from them. We need to do something different. And in particular, what I think we need to do different is impose direct cost on the criminals, because there are fewer criminals than there are attacks. Okay, so the way I'm going to do that... Oh, I was supposed to be on that slide. The way I'm going to do that is a controversial example. So I want to first prove to you... Prove that there aren't that many criminals. And the way I want to do it is to look at the number of incarcerated Americans. Now, this, this like sits in the heart of American culture wars. There's 500 Fox News pieces about this. I'm not trying to make a political point here. What I want to use is this data to try and make a point there aren't that many criminals. So if you look at the top 10 countries in the world for number of incarcerated people, the only one that has a decent due process and rule of law, you can argue about that, but I'm talking about the difference between, say, a dictatorship and a... Uh, a, a developed country, has a well-staffed, well-funded police force, is the US. So if you look at the, the US as an example within that top 10, this is the number of incarcerated people. Now, that it's problematic, right? They're arresting too many people. I'm not trying to make that point. Within the US right now, there's 531 people in prison for every 100,000 people in the US. So those of you who are fast with your maths will know that that's 0.5% of the population. So what that means is there's 99.5% of the population that aren't in prison. Now, how does that map to the actual criminals within the US? I don't know. I think there's people in prison who are innocent and there's people who are not in prison who, uh, who are guilty. But even if you had to double that number at 1%, and that would be huge, that would put them at like the most number of incarcerated people ever in the history of the world by orders of magnitude, that would still be 1% versus 99%. There are far more people who aren't criminals than there are of criminals. Then if we boil it down to the number of people engaging in cybercrime, which is our interest here, that's an even smaller number. So I don't think that there's a lot of criminals. Now, the differences matter. The US is a large place. I'm sure there's different levels of criminality in different parts of the country or different kinds of crime. I'm sure New York has a higher proportion of white collar crime than say, Georgia. The other problem is the more criminality there is or the fewer consequences there are, the more criminality continues. So South Africa has a problem where there isn't much visible justice and the criminality is increasing. We have a problem where we got grey listed because of some of our financial controls. So we have a problem where organized crime is flourishing within South Africa. We've got a dramatic increase of organized crime in South Africa such that other law enforcement agencies from around the world are starting to get involved to protect their citizens based on the criminality that's growing in this country. So we also need to do something about this to prevent more criminals from deciding that this is a life that's going to work from them. Uh, and South Africa has an urgent and pressing need to do that. Okay, what should we do? Now, anyone who's been in this industry long enough will know at some point they've had the hackback debate. And the hackback debate is, I know how to penetrate systems, why don't I just penetrate criminal systems? Huh? Like they're hacking us, hack onto them as they hack onto us if you've watched hackers. The problem with that is it's illegal and you would be a vigilante. And the problem with vigilantism is you're denying people their due process, and the problem with that is you might violate people's human rights, and human rights are a pretty important part of how we structure our societies and look after each other. So there is risk to yourself in engaging in illegal hackback because you are conducting a crime, which now limits potentially your future career prospects if you get caught. There is risk to bystanders, if you hack a server that you believe is conducting attacks against you and you take it down and it turns out that that was an innocent third party who had some vulnerabilities the attacker had used as a jump box, you have now created worse consequences for that innocent bystander than the attacker had because at least the attacker had an interest in keeping that box up. It's an overly simplistic example. So I'm not encouraging vigilantism. The, the, the tools and methods we have available to us are different. Okay, so who wants to complete the saying for me? The best defense is a good offense. offense, yes. I'm not saying that. I'm saying the specific offense I want to talk about is a good arrest. I want to affect law enforcement outcomes. Okay, so before we get into the detail of how I think we can do that, 
this is a still from Ted Lasso, if anyone's watched it, you'll know the power of this sign, is I want you to believe that this is possible. Because if we give up on law enforcement, if we go that's not gonna happen in South Africa, then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy or it is sustained as a self-fulfilling prophecy. If we do not believe we can meaningfully impact criminals, if we do not believe we can deal with the root cause problem in cybersecurity, then what are we doing? We got into this to deal with hard problems. Hard problems are a fun challenge for a lot of us. Let's focus the hard problem on the place where we're gonna have the greatest impact. So I need you to believe first off, before we get into the detail. Okay, so what, what's in law enforcement's tool belt beyond an arrest? So the first thing is they can detain people, not just after they've been successfully charged. They can detain people for questioning. They can get warrants to access their devices. Those devices can give you information that can point to other criminals and criminality. There's a whole bunch of freedoms that they can limit during an investigation against a criminal. Then they can also arrest people, put them in prison, limit their economic activity, their travel opportunities, their ability to see their children. You can charge people. Once there are charges, you need to face those charges in a court of law. Once again, law enforcement has an ability to detain people if they believe that they're going to be a flight risk. They have an ability to seize assets that might be used in further criming. Criming, by the way, was coined by Shifty Mike. You can see his talk later today, too. Governments can put sanctions on countries, but they can also put them on individuals. The US loves doing this. They keep putting sanctions on Russians and Chinese actors uh, that have been involved in nation state criming. But most countries have an ability to put sanctions on an individual. Those sanctions can all have different effects. They can prevent people from opening bank accounts, from transacting with your business. They can prevent people from flying and getting on planes. There's a lot of stuff that you can do to threat actors uh, through that way. And then the most important one is you can seize assets. You can seize the toys that they're using to attack you. You can seize the profits that they, uh, they gain from that crime. You can seize the car that they bought with the money that they stole from the tunny down the road. This is a very powerful way to deprive criminals of their, um, of their benefits. And this happens, right? So the Black Axe is a prolific organized crime syndicate operating in South Africa. Between the Hawks, between the SAPS, between Interpol, between uh, the US Secret Service, there have been numerous arrests. And the nice thing about these arrests is they lead to more arrests as they get more information. And this is a link from Interpol's website. The quote in there kind of goes without saying, but I think sometimes people forget. After they arrested them, there was a significant drop in the number of attacks they did. Shock and awe. Maybe we can have more impact on reducing the total attacks we face by arresting the criminals who are conducting those attacks. Here's an example where the FBI and European uh, partners took down QuackBot. The really interesting thing, beyond denying them of their toys, they also uninstalled QuackBot across a whole bunch of infected machines. Those are really powerful things that you can do, and nobody did anything illegal. This was all due process. Nobody's going to prison for doing it. Within South Africa, we have very strong asset seizure uh, laws in place, and it's active and it's happening. So in 2022, they did nearly six billion um, frozen assets. Uh, and they recovered nearly 300 million rands worth of, of thefts. Those are actual things happening right now, powerful consequences that we can put on criminals acting, acting within South Africa. Okay, so next question is, how can we help? And the first thing that I think we can do is realize that attribution matters. So what that means is not that you know it is Bob in the basement at his mother's house on whatever road. It's that you start identifying the criminal groups or the campaigns or the attacks and lumping them together. And the reason we're doing this is for the second part, that we want to quantify the losses. Law enforcement acts on certain financial thresholds. So if you can go, they stole 10,000 Rand from the tunny down the road, but they also stole a total of 100 million rand from this group of people. Law enforcement has now exceeded their threshold for action and are not quite forced to act, but very interested in acting. And then you also, as a defender, are very interested in this, um, uh, in this being resolved. So it's a way for us to prioritize which groups we're going after and making sure we're not wasting our time on small fry. We also need to, and this is the hard part, share across industries and across organizations. We've seen numerous threat actors in South Africa who operate against a bank and a retail company because they know there's no collaboration between those two. Or they'll operate, that if they're gonna go across a bunch of banks, they know at some point it's gonna be brought up in Sabric and they're gonna have a bad time. It's easier to work across industry to avoid consequences. How do we encourage collaboration at that level? It's very difficult. We want to link the activity so that we quantify the losses. And then after that, we have a referral that we can give to law enforcement. And they take that intelligence 
and they turn it into evidence. That's their job. So you can give them a whole dossier, a whole bunch of facts, and point this gun where it needs to. They don't necessarily know where they need to go. They need people to report crimes so that they know who to go after. It, it's not their job to just stand around waiting for a crime to happen and go do that. As citizens, you need to report the crime. As organizations with large security budgets and skilled, uh, skilled people, what information can we give them to make it more successful? And so if you look at the Lockheed Martin uh, Defending Along the Kill Chain paper, ooh, am I out of time? No, okay, good, my timer ran out. Um, they, they talked about these different stages of an attack and the way that you can cluster different intrusions together so you can go this one threat actor engaged in all of this activity. We were able to cluster this activity together. And the last part, action on objectives, is what they're actually there to do as an attack. And I think what this is missing is the follow the money part. You know, how do we understand what the actual losses are? And I don't mean hypothetical losses, not like it cost us seven rand for each email we sent to tell someone that their password has been breached. I mean the actual money that they stole, the actual assets that they, they compromised. If we can start to put that in there, then we can exceed the financial thresholds that help law enforcement know to act. I don't know how to do this cross-company sharing thing. There was a whole cyber policy framework put out by the government uh, which was supposed to enable sectoral C certs so that would all talk to each other. It would all be centralized by the cybercrime hub on private industry. That would all make it to the cyber response center. It was magnificent. I don't know where that implementation is. It's slow. South Africa has other priorities beyond building um, these giant things. So we need to do them ourselves. And right now, a lot of these industry things exist, but they're coffee meetups. And people are defensive about the information they share there. We don't meaningfully share, hey, this crime group is criming in this way at this level. I don't have all of the information. Have you seen any of this criming? Maybe go look. Here's some IOCs that we were able to extract from the criming we saw on their system. Let's go speak to other people in the industry because we happen to see that that C2 was talking to something else. This needs a technical sharing response based on meaningful, trusted individuals. And the industry situation we have right now is there's, there's more competitive... Uh, there's more competition between members of that organization than there is meaningful sharing about that. So the criminals get to exist between the gaps of our distrust. Okay, then I also think we can impose private cost. We don't only need to rely on law enforcement, and there are things we can do which are legal that won't get you put in prison. So the one is infrastructure takedowns. All right, so if you say, hey, this was used in a phishing kit, uh, these servers are hosting malware, those sorts of things. Those things do get reasonably responded to a lot of the time, and you can make it more frustrating for a threat actor to continue to operate. You can exploit their attack tooling. Hang on, I don't mean conduct crimes. There are lots of vulnerabilities in attacker tools. I know because any attacker tool I've ever written has been the most vulnerable piece of software anyone has ever written. There are lots of vulnerability in attacker tools that can be used to gain information about what that attack tool is doing. Look for vulnerabilities in attack tools that give us an information advantage that allow you to extract the information we need to cluster intrusions together, to link activities to threat actors. Don't exploit a remote code execution vulnerability on a server. Now you're crossing the line. There's lots of information gathering opportunities. The Trace Labs people are here. Uh, I think there's a lot of open source intelligence that can be used against threat actors. I think they are used. You've got smart people who do OSINT stuff within your organization, use it against the threat actors to build that intelligence dossier that you're gonna to give to law enforcement. I think we can do more to support law enforcement. I think we can give them discounts if we have commercial, uh, commercial things to help the security community. I think you can make it easier for them to interact with your organization where there isn't risk of a privacy violation. Enforcing that they require onerous mandates and warrants when they're trying to get information in pursuit of a threat actor sometimes introduces more friction. I'm not saying avoid due process, but how can you support law enforcement when they come to you? How can you meet law enforcement so they know they can come to you? Uh, then I also think we should allocate some budget towards this. I think within organizations that have security budgets, part of your budget should be how do I infect affect a law enforcement outcome? How do I reduce the amount of crime happening in this country? And what portion of my budget is associated with that? 
So I want to give you an example of the kind of information gathering I'm talking about from when we talk about exploiting attack tooling. So this is some research from Checkpoint, but if you look at Unit 42's research from Palo Alto, uh, if you look at Fox IT uh, in the Netherlands, like there's lots of public examples where people were exploiting attack tooling to gain information. So here they were able to cluster attacks together because this one was using the same encryption key as this one. This one had the same... Um, yeah, identifier in there. I don't want to get in too much into the detail. AfriForum, controversial organization, again, I'm not making a political point. AfriForum has a private prosecution unit. Fascinating. The idea is if the NPA refuses to prosecute a case, they can choose to prosecute the case. There's two potential advantages that come out of it. The one obvious thing is they successfully prosecute the case, and the person goes to jail. The other is that the NPA goes, wow, that's a winnable case, I'm going to take it back in which case they've served as a pressure group to pressure the NPA into taking that back on. Is it time we create a cyber private prosecution unit? It doesn't make sense to create it now because we still need to do all of the work to get the investigation, uh, evidence gathering, prosecution part, the stuff that's needed to support the prosecution part. But I think in time this might be worthwhile. And this is one of the ways that we can operate cross industry and cross, cross country. So my, my call to action for those of you who do have budgets is Think, how can I allocate part of that budget to supporting law enforcement so that we can affect law enforcement outcomes? But really what I'm trying to tell you today is I want the criminals, <laughs> I want the criminals to find out. I want it to be visible public justice such that when a criminal engages in crime, they have a bad time and other potential criminals go, that looks like a bad way to live my life. I'm not going to do that. And because they are the root cause of this problem, it is the place where our efforts will have the highest reward. And so let's stop leaning into defensive methods that will give us no further advantage if we do more of them harder. Again, I'm not saying don't do the basics, don't patch, don't look after vulnerabilities. But at some point, when does it make sense not to make every vulnerability your organization might face your strategic plan. At some point, where does it make sense to go, how do we identify the criminals attacking us and make sure that they can't continue doing that? Because doing so will reduce the amount of attacks we see, but also the amount of crime in the country, reduce further criminals. It's the right way to go. So that is my proposal to you today. How do you take this thinking into what you do? If you're a developer, if you're um, a defender, if you're on the network side, if you're on the corporate side, I don't quite know how this applies to you. So like I said, I don't have a polished do this answer and everything will be magical. I also am under no illusion that tomorrow suddenly everything will be good. But how do we make sure that 10 years from now, when one of you gives a talk, we can reflect on the meaningful impact we've had on the amount of crime and criminals that we face in our community? Thank you very much for your time. <laughs>